Welcome to a really special episode of The Neuro Show featuring NorCal Cycling, the vegan cyclist, and Dylan Johnson. This is a big and banger episode. We're going to talk about our favorite bikes from 2024, what we learned training-wise. We're going to go deep into tires, aero gains, and all things YouTube. So without any further ado, let's get into it. Five heads. Look at this. Look at this absolute disaster waiting to happen. On the bike, on the bike, did you guys, any any learnings, any highs and lows that you specifically maybe wanted to, to highlight? Uh, for me, Dylan has been on the up. He's trending up. He's having some of his best results and crushing. Uh, Jeff barely raced, and I made six videos. <laughs> so, like... Way to go, Dylan. <laughs> I appreciate that. Representing. What was the big change for you, Dylan, to really like make you, you know, find your rhythm? The last video that I put out was about uh, iron levels in cyclists. And, you know, I don't get very personal in my science based videos. Maybe I should get more personal. Maybe more people would connect with it. Uh, but that wasn't just a topic that I. You know, I was like, well, I need to cover this topic, so I'll cover it. It actually was personal to me. I got um I got blood work done earlier this year and I was I was borderline anemic iron levels. Uh and I don't know how long I've been dealing with that. Uh I've gotten kind of infrequent blood work throughout the last I don't know, since I since I started bike racing. Um and my iron levels have never been crazy, but they've never been that low. And once I'll be honest, once I sorted that out with supplementation, it made a huge difference. Uh, I felt a lot better and my recovery got a lot quicker. And I think that a lot of a lot of times, maybe when I thought I was overtraining, I wasn't actually overtraining. I just had low iron levels. That's super interesting. So I uh, had worked with a company that was doing fresh spirulina um, a long time ago. Mm -hmm. And like the the right spirulina is some of the best way to absorb iron. It's like 99% absorption rate for iron uh, in a natural way. And I was taking that and I had probably never felt better uh, when I was taking mm -hmm. that. I've since not been able to find a good source and it's kind of gone away and I've stopped supplementing iron altogether do, do you think you'll change your your diet to to um not have that problem in the future or supplementation is the way to go uh no there are things i mean i, I don't want to plug my youtube channel here but people should go and watch the last video i made there are definitely things that you can do with your diet to increase your absorption of iron as well thinking about that ever since i watched that video and um it, i mean my takeaway was like, and maybe I'm iron deficient. You know what I mean? Maybe I need to, uh, <laughs> maybe that'll make me faster. Let's do a survey. So, so Dylan, you've, your iron's been low. Chris, I know yours has been low in the past. Vegan, ha have you had a blood test and it's come back low or you just suspect it's been low? No, no, um, it sure. hasn't come back low. I've gotten okay. three different blood tests. Um, uh, so I don't know why it wouldn't be low, but I, I mean, I also don't like, track it regularly so i mean there's okay. good chances that i have been low at some point yeah so and then jeff you have you ever your blood tests or? i may have i used to get okay. a regular uh, medical health screening for the, the work that i do um but i haven't in a while and even when i did it's it's well it's been like five years since i've actually done it um but even when I did, I don't even know if, if iron was included in that. So the short answer is no. I don't. Yeah, I, I've never even tested it. Probably wouldn't if it was a standard one. I, mine hasn't been low on a blood test, but I suspect it was back in 2018 when I was racing. Um, say that altitude for I was racing, and I just based on how I felt, I'm pretty sure it was low. Although since I got back, it hasn't been. So that's pretty much half of everyone here, or actually the majority, because if I count myself in, Chris and Dylan uh, have been iron. I either low iron or iron deficient at some point, which is pretty, um, yeah, it's pretty, uh, pretty crazy. And, I mean, I know you, you harp on it a bit, Jesse, but like, it, it kind of shocks me that Jeff, that you haven't done more. I, I mean, to me, it, and it wasn't until the, the low iron thing became a massive deal for me. In fact, mine was so low. I actually ended up having to do an, an iron infusion. Like they, like they literally got the results. And the doctor, and you never really get the call from the doctor here. That's really rare. And it was like, come in now. It's like, okay. And um, 
yeah, they they sent me to a clinic that day over in Hunter's Hill to get an iron infusion. And the only way I can describe it is like, because the, the regression had been so slow over, I don't know how long a period of time, it never felt, I never felt that bad. It's because it was a slow decline. When they pumped me full of iron and I walked out of that clinic, I thought I was on the best stuff anyone had ever given anyone. It was unbelievable. It was like so I was looking through the world like that, and then someone just went, like, took the blindfolds off. I don't want to get annoying about this. And I did change my YouTube channel name to VC Adventures uh, to get away whoa, from Whoa, hold the phone. That's oh, big congratulations. news. Wow. Wow. I didn't, yeah. whoa. Uh, when did that happen? Uh, 30 seconds before I uploaded the, the last video that I did. Um, awesome. just felt like, dude, it's, same, it's, lo same logo. I didn't change anything, but the name, you know, I just, I just changed it, uh, and the handle to VC adventures. Um, you know, I just, uh, it, look, I've never been an activist for the vegan diet. Um, it, you know, it's just, it's a part of my life. I dig it, but you know, dude, it's, just, it's, I'm running into such a roadblock and now, um, this is kind of a side tangent, but like, uh, we actually talked about this on your podcast a while ago where the new world is not subscribing anymore. They just let the algorithm do the thing. And so around 85% of my views are from non-subscribers. And so when they see a video pop up and it, all they see is that word vegan, they're just like, I fucking hate this guy, you know? <laughs> and so uh, it's really been like, you know, just, I get comments all the time anyway. So I, I whatever, I changed the name. I'm excited. I've got like a two year runway uh, for some new adventures and some new stuff. It's, it's pretty sweet. But, um, you know, I, if we were ever talking about low iron instantly, it's like, oh yeah, that vegan guy, he's definitely got low iron. He, it sucks to eat plants. Like you're killing yourself yet. Everyone here is like, yeah, I've got low iron. Right. And so it's not necessarily a meat eating thing, Dylan. I mean, what have you seen? Well, so some people may not know this, but I'm actually the the second vegan cycling YouTuber. I just don't have it in the title of my uh, my YouTube channel, and I think I've talked about it one time in one video at the end of the video. So most people would probably not know that I'm vegan because I, I was going to say I, I somehow knew that. I, I think I watch all of your videos. <laughs> wow! All right, all right. That one's from a while ago. So I guess yeah, that so, kind of ruins my point. My point yeah. was like, oh, you you all meat eaters have low well, iron, you know. But Je yeah. Jesse, you follow some sort of plant based diet. I, as well, I, I was vegan for a while, and now I'm vegetarian. But I, I, I I've take I when uh, my training loads high, I just take an iron supplement. So I uh, yeah, never ran into that. Yeah, no, I I don't I don't talk much about veganism on my channel. Probably about as much as vegan cyclist does, despite <laughs> his channel name. <laughs> Is, I, I request pretty regularly, um, if I can, the riders I coach get blood tests. And I would say just get, they just off, I haven't like done the numbers, but about a quarter, if they get iron studies done, have a, a ferritin level where I'm getting them to look into supplementing or, or, or increasing it through dietary changes first up. Um, like a quarter, that's quite... So, so I would say that the, the main point that I was trying to drive home with that video, and I don't want to talk about this video that I just made for half this podcast, but the point that I was trying to get at is that this is a serious problem amongst endurance athletes. Uh, it particularly affects endurance athletes. And the main reason why there's more iron loss in endurance athletes is because we sweat so much more than the average person does. And there is iron loss in sweat. Um, so it's just, if you're an endurance athlete, it just makes sense to go get a blood test and you shouldn't be supplementing with iron if you haven't gotten a blood test. And you know that that's the reason for your chronic fatigue, because chronic fatigue could be caused by so many different things, obviously. But as, as an endurance athlete, it's, it, you know, it's not just a vegan problem. I would say it's an endurance athlete problem and endurance athletes should be getting regular blood work done. Uh, I, I want to segue into a question um, about doping with this. So I want to yes. do a video. I want to do a video <laughs> in, in, in my vlogs uh, this coming December or whatever this month. And I want to talk about like the gray area of doping and like what is considered doping? 
And I think mm-hmm. like on a, on, you know, knee jerk reaction is like, oh, it's so simple. It's, it's steroids. But that's not really what it is, right? There's tons of gray area uh, if you dive into the WADA band list and like umbrella, you know, things where it's like compounds that have nothing to do with performance or anything, but they're under an umbrella. And so it's like, Mm -hmm. you know, and then uh, two years ago, Dylan, we stayed at the same house at Unbound. You were a pharmacy. You literally brought out like (laughs) 35 different things you were taking. And so when you're talking about supplementing with iron, you know, and then Chris, you said you thought it was the best stuff you've ever been on. Where does this fall on that gray area of like, what is, what is doping and why is this legal and why is something else not? Well, uh, to me, it's pretty black and white. You go on global DRO. You select that you're an athlete, the country you're living in your sport, and you type in whatever it is, if it's a supplement, if it's a drug, and it tells you if it's banned in competition, out of competition, or, or you're free to use it. And if it's banned, it's banned. If it's not banned, you can take it. Because, because to your yeah, but, point, Tyler, you could go to like GCN I, I, and get a supplement that is going to ban you from, from cycling, or your doctor could prescribe you something, right? If you're like a master's athlete who's low T and the doctor's like, well, we'll take this, you know, and like, they don't realize that you're racing under a license and this is very problematic. Y- yeah. But, but I mean, you should, you should know if you're going to like, t- like testosterone is pretty clear, I would say, but the, the thing of, is it, is it legal for in competition out of competition? Uh, that is wildly up for interpretation like cannabis you know what I mean? Cannabis is legal for out of competition, illegal for in competition, but you will test positive for cannabis 30 to 45 days. You know what I mean? So like now there's a threshold. So, mm-hmm. so Tyler, I, are you, I want to clarify, are you asking for an individual where, where is the line between doping and not doping? Or are you asking for WADA? Like what, how does WADA determine the line between doping and not doping? Because I want to, I want to know from your point of view, like each one of us has a different outlook on it. And what is yours? I would go to, I would go to exactly what Jesse said. Um, For example, Lifetime Grand Prix does drug testing and they, they have a, they have a doping, uh, I don't know, seminar anti-doping seminar for us at the beginning of the year. And they tell us, you know, go to global DRO. And and if you're confused about anything, look it up there. And to me, I think that the anti-doping rules are, are pretty clear and unambiguous. And that's, that's the line. You don't cross that line. So I'm, I'm, I'm with you boys. It's, it's pretty clear when it comes to, it comes to that stuff where it gets really muddy for me is the TUE stuff. So um, the therapeutic use, someone can help me out, exemption. Um, and that's like, so um, the, even like the, the puffer stuff, the, the asthma type thing, um, where, where, where a doctor can, you know, you can get prescribed something that naturally your levels are, are low. Okay. Well, so where do we start drawing the line? Because, you know, naturally my red blood cells aren't as good as Jesse's. So does that mean I can therefore enhance those to get to his sort of his level? I, I don't know. If- Just in terms of where the line is vegan. So for example, uh, I don't have asthma, but I'll, I'll use an asthma puffer for some sessions because it's not banned. Do you, do you think that, crosses a line is that is that what you mean do you think well, yeah, that's it's, a gray it's, area? It's, yeah it's definitely gray like uh so because there's different usages so when my chris room had gotten busted uh i was like well that's so dumb it's not a performance enhancement i have an inhaler uh to keep me alive but then when you dug into it it was like actually they they're taking that medication and they're injecting it intravenously it's not just a puffer and so they're able to get their levels to this crazy high you know, point in which no one could ever achieve through a puffer. And then mm. it had like weight loss benefits, right? So it had nothing to do with like a cardio thing. It was like, it somehow kept weight off. And so then it's mm-hmm. like, well, yeah, that's, that's, that to me seems like doping. You're taking a non-banned substance and you're like hacking the system 
to give yourself, you know, this performance enhancement, but like talking again about the, the, uh, you know, low iron, you know, I'm low in this. I take this, it bumps me up. It interchange. What you're taking is either legal or not legal. So if you have a performance gain from bumping your iron up, what makes that different than potentially any other substance? Yeah, it's a fair point. I mean, <laughs> so so I want to I want to go back to my clarification though. Are you talking about for the individual? Because I think for the individual, it's it's a clear answer. It's just whatever whatever the World Anti Doping Agency says. But f- are we talking about for the world for WADA right now? Are how does WADA de- how does WADA determine what is and is not doping? Where is the line? Because a, a sup you know at what point does a supplement be become an illegal performance enhancing drug. Well, I think it's crazy because you could have your whole identity destroyed uh, over because WADA changes something, right? Like Tramadol wasn't banned for a while um, and now it is, but it's like, what if you took Tramadol when it wasn't banned, but then you got your, your P held and then they tested it, but now it is banned, right? Like that's kind of, strange and then again the cannabis thing you know if you smoke 10 days before a race and then you pee you're gonna test positive so now there's a threshold so now it's like well how much does your body what is that threshold and i think and that threshold is pretty this? high though for, for for cannabis isn't it quite high like i um i think the in competition stuff um the threshold's really high like you got to be like like stoned on race day i think <laughs> or like the day before for recovery i think that's what they're trying to get rid of right Tyler, totally which is like shit t- Tyler's like, yeah, no, I mean, what, it, it makes sense like i mean you don't you know there's a safety standard right like you're not hitting a bong right before a race but like that again it's just like gets into this weird gray of uh, and then so it's there was that a, stays uh, in your system for a long time it gets really confusing because to your point like you could you could be out of competition and be uh following the rules but then it because it takes your body so long to metabolize it you could still give a test. That's why I think, I think the thresholds are quite high. Um, I don't know personally, but I had a former teammate who like ran into this, like he freaked out because he was randomly tested and he's like, yeah, but I smoked a joint not that long ago and he, nothing ever came of it. So I think, and then he looked into it and the thresholds are quite high. How how many times have, have, has everyone been tested? I was, I was tested in college for running or no, no, no. I was tested in no, I was tested in college for cycling. And then since I've been in the Grand Prix, I've not been tested. Okay. Yeah, I got tested when I won the the Nationals. Um, but to be honest, like, it's really, really expensive uh, to do a PED test. So there's like a difference of like mm. your standard, are you on meth uh, or cocaine? <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, that's a very yeah. simple test. But if you're trying to see, are you on growth hormone or like you know deca yeah. or like what yeah. all this stuff like that's like a from what i understand around a three thousand dollar test so i think a lot of these places they'll test you as like precaution like they want to act like they're testing but i can't really mm-hmm. imagine these places are spending that kind of money uh to mm-hmm. go and actually search for like growth hormone or something i um i've never been tested the uh the standard practice though here is if it's a national level event and you win congratulations vegan <laughs> you get tested and then generally once they're there they will um grab uh they will grab a random number of sampling of other riders um not necessarily on the podium but um other riders so they tell you right. and and it's 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 a little bit ominous when they tell you when you show up and you register they're yeah. like hey so USA anti doping is here Um, you may get called upon, even if you get pulled out of the race or whatever, no matter what your result is. So you have to hang out and find out because if you forget, you finish your race, you're out with the boys having a beer or whatever, that's, that's like an admission of guilt. If they call you and you're not there to give the the test. So, and do you guys, do you guys know a guy's, a guy's testing positive? Uh, Just because that, that's so us. Yeah. USA cycling, uh, a couple years ago, it was really bad for masters. So then they came out and they said, hey, we're going to charge everyone an extra $30 a year and we're going to put together this crazy anti-doping program or we're going to test randomly across everything. They did it twice 
but you still get charged for it. And then they've just stopped doing it altogether. Like, I mean, they, they only, tr they test at like national level, but at masters nationals, they only tested the winners. Um, mm -hmm. that's it. And it's like, well, then where the hell is our money going? You know, you, you said you're going to ramp up all the testing. Uh, but I haven't really seen that be a thing, but you can go See? on the website and it will list. And, th and this is what, like, when I was kind of looking at doing this video is kind of getting crazy. Some people, you know, it's like tested positive for all this stuff, EPO growth. Like one guy five years ago said, I shouldn't be penalized because I didn't win. So it didn't work. <laughs> that was his excuse. Like, well, he, you're, he was on EPO growth and testosterone. Like he was on the full Lance cocktail and, and, but he got like 16th. So he was like, well, it's not, it doesn't work. So anyways, uh, you know, you can go on, you can see all the people, people that test positive, but what's mm. crazy is that they just say Dylan Johnson fails doping control. And that's it. Well, there's, and, there's our reel this week. That's brilliant. <laughs> yeah. So like, <laughs> I, I'm just saying that like, that's what goes out. Dude, and so uh, it, it could be Tyler, something. what are you trying to do to me? You said I <laughs> looked like a pharmacy when I showed up to Unbound and you said I failed the doping control. I want that I, 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 I thought, Can you make that I thought that shirt? I was taking, I thought I was taking less supplements than you were. <laughs> yeah. I, I just use that as a, uh, I'm just saying when they say the name and then they say failed doping mm -hmm. control. And so then everyone yeah. just assumes it's something wildly crazy. But there was a guy local, like this was 10 years ago, uh, but he had a tainted supplement, which sounds ridiculous, but is absolutely something that happens. Uh, mm -hmm. And it was like a diuretic under an umbrella. So it was like, it's not in performance enhancement. It's just linked to potentially someone trying to flush their system out. And it was like mm. picograms of this stuff. And what came across was failed doping control. And he lost his ride. You know, he's like on a, a domestic pro team. He like lost his job. Like he lost everything. And it was like, yeah, you know, he just took some, like a pre-workout from GNC. And, you know, mm. so it's just like kind of weird that they will blast people's names out there without really giving too much information. But if you're an athlete who's got a high chance of being tested, you should just be taking batch tested supplements so you don't have that risk. Uh, so, yeah, as you move higher up in the sport, you have to just become more and more conservative with what you're taking. But it's for really sure. on the athlete I, to do that. Yeah. I think if you're way up there, you know, and you're that's what you're doing for a living. But like when it's just comes down to some amateur, you know, I mean, imagine yeah. like some 55 year old guy who goes and races for his first time. You, the altitude camps, I don't know what you guys think about this. I want to hear hear what your opinions are on this. Altitude camps in the world tour have become incredibly popular. Uh, I'm pretty familiar with altitude camps myself because a lot of these Grand Prix races are at altitude. And when you're doing a race at altitude, obviously altitude acclimation is very important. However, the research on altitude acclimation for sea level races is I would say mixed at best. And it's not really, I would say it's not very conclusive that it's going to help you at a sea level race. Um, in fact, there, you know, there, it depends on the person, but there's some people it probably hurts their performance because they're just not able to train as well when they're at altitude. I have a sneaking suspicion and I will admit that I could be completely wrong here. I have a sneaking suspicion that the world tour teams are using these altitude camps to mask doping. You want to go, Jesse? Mm, yeah, I had a um, suspicion of the same thing, which I'm pretty sure I said on the show as well a while back, that when you're going to altitude, you're expecting a change in hemoglobin so you can report back to the anti-doping authorities that you're at altitude and they'll give you more lenience in your biological passport. Uh, so... Now, what is actually causing that change in hemoglobin in the blood? Well, in theory, it's because you're at altitude at an altitude camp. But if you just say you're up there, maybe you're not up there. Maybe you're, yeah, maybe you're at sea level and you're just taking a, <laughs> a doping substance is bumping your hemoglobin up and you're getting sea level training. That's, I don't know. I'm, don't, I don't have a basis for that. I'm just saying that's like a theory. Um, there's also the practicality, the the you know the whereabouts program, and how and how these you know these altitude camps are relatively remote. You're you're able to 
be aware then when certain tester is is coming in and we know that there's that window i think it's like 11 p.m to 6 a.m or something that the testers can't test and so the the fact that you're at this remote location you're aware when there are outsiders coming in just buys you more time to do whatever you're going to do and and i think we all realize at this point that as if, if anyone is going down this route of doping, it's all this micro doping stuff that's able to be flushed out. I mean, anytime we talk about doping on the show, I get emails from people with lots of letters after their name saying essentially this type of thing, that the micro doping is out of your system in a a certain amount of time. And that's very, very, very feasible that if you are the, the place to do this type of thing from a pure practicality is in a remote Alpine location. Well, uh, Lance Armstrong was on uh, Peter Ataya's podcast recently, and um, you know he's kind of like cagey about talking about it. But he did say uh, that when they were doing EPO, uh, that they were doing a, 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 a substance of it or a, or a version of it that had a half life of like two hours. So he was like, by the time the race is over, it's out of your system. So it, it was kind, of, I, and I didn't know that, but like. That's insane that they could be as doped as could possibly be. And then just by the end of the race. And then, you know, that's what Chris Froome also got in trouble is that his uh, he was trying to be so dehydrated or whatever at the end of the ride. And so then he was like, yeah, but my pee is like super concentrated. And it was like really weird. Right. And so but I will say that when I got back from Bolivia uh, I I've trained at altitude. I, I live somewhat close to altitude. I've never seen any altitude gains whatsoever, but when I went to Bolivia and I was at 13,000 plus for like 10 days, when I got back, I, it, I, I kept calibrating my power meter over and over and over again. Cause I was like, something has to be wrong. And I went, yeah, well, it's a Shimano power meter. So something was wrong. <laughs> well, I mean, I just, I, it was so wild that when I, I came from Bolivia and I went straight to the coast and I did, uh, I have never done 400 Watts for more than like eight minutes. And I did 440 Watts for 10 minutes. Uh, and then after that, like immediately recovered and, and then was just, I just went and got like KOMs left and right all over the place. I was like, what the shit is this? And, uh, I, I was <laughs> blown away about how much of a performance gain I did get um, from living, but like that's way up there. Those are proper fucking world tour numbers. <laughs> are we gonna are we gonna power meter check here? <laughs> Holy shit! Well, I did. So I did get top ten on a segment that's like really, really difficult, uh, and I was getting other KOMs. So like, yeah. re- regardless if the power meter is reading high, um, you know, I there's other objective metrics to where, you know, that I was flying, but yeah, you know, I don't know. It lasted like two weeks and then it slowly kind of drizzled away. And now I have no chance of seeing those numbers, but it was wild. I mean, tent. Mm-hmm. Well, yeah. dude, it was so painful. Like it was not fun. Like you would wake up every three to five minutes gasping for air. I just couldn't, I couldn't sleep. Uh, everything felt uncomfortable. Um, it was what what was the altitude again base was 136 and then we wow. we rode up to 171 on uh, on oh, on Jesus. one day we went through five 14ers carrying on from um so maybe next year you'll go to bolivia what are what are you guys thinking as well for racing next year um like if you if you're going to continue Try and stepping up results wise, Jeff. I don't know what your plans are racing wise, but you've got anything up your sleeve to to um to keep improving next year? What's what's the? Plan? Yeah, I'm I'm racing for Mike Spikes another year. Um, you know it's it's hard. I'd love to go out and do a bunch of the national level stuff. Um, but uh, realistically, our local racing district is is really competitive. Um, it's looking like it's gonna be more competitive this year even. So I like to focus on that um, when districts are possible and um, and then do what I've done in the last couple of years, which is kind of take that peak fitness, usually um, around uh, midsummer time, and go out to something like Intelligentsia or Nationals, like what I've done, um, you know, and uh, 
remind myself, humble myself up against proper UCI pros and be like, oh, that's right. There's like another level. And by the way, there's another level past that. So um, I'm always searching to get beat by better riders because I think it makes me stronger. But but definitely the local scene is going to be is going to be nice and competitive. And I'd like to be um, where I was. God, it's been uh, two years now, 2021. Um, had, a, had a good season. It'd be nice to go back to that. So is that, is that how you set the benchmark? I guess because Dylan's probably like, I want to be 5% better than last year. Wants to I, finish 15th. Chris is like, I want to be within 5% of yeah, five somebody years posed ago. This would this to nice. me. And, and, where, where are you at? Um, somebody posed this to me. It's an interesting question. Um, I don't know if there's a right answer, but it's like, would you rather, I might mess this up. It's been a while since I've thought about it. Would you rather um, have a, like, let's say it's a time trial. Would you rather win the time trial, but have a non PR or lose the time trial, but have your best PR? Like that kind of tells like where you're at in your journey as a cyclist. And I think it's, it's, a, it's an interesting, um, your answer kind of tells where you're at as an athlete. So, uh, so Dylan, <laughs> which one? Can I, 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 I love that you just brought that up. Because this is this is actually I might go on a little bit of a rant here about some Why of my I brought fellow it up, lifetime dude. please <laughs> about some of my fellow lifetime Grand Prix athletes. Um, the the lifetime Grand Prix is very competitive, and it only got more competitive this past year than it was the year previously. And a lot of my fellow Grand Prix athletes found themselves not getting the results that they're used to getting. And I don't think it's because they were less fit. I think if anything, they were more fit. I think what happened was they found themselves in a pool that was so competitive that they couldn't get the results that they're used to getting, uh, myself included, right? I, it, this, this pool of athletes is competitive enough that I, this is the first year uh, since I started racing bikes that I didn't win a race. Uh, and it's just because I didn't do any local racing. I pretty much just focused on the Grand Prix and a handful of other races. Um, and man, I, you know, the Grand Prix, I, 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 their mentality, a lot of their mentality, I don't want to call anyone out by name, but a lot okay. of their mentality was, was like, oh, you know, another bad race. Oh man, I can't believe I had a bad result. So it's, just so much crying on social media about how they had bad races. And if you actually look objectively at how they did at Leadville, for example, there were people that got PRs at Leadville, their fastest time ever at Leadville that were claiming that they had a bad race. That's not a, that's not a bad race. Maybe it's not the result you wanted, but if you're saying that's a, that's a bad race that, you know, I, I don't know what to tell you. You went faster than you ever did. So, well, that, I mean, for you, for you, Dylan, it's crazy because like you've been racing at a very high level, let's say for, for four or five years at this level, right? The gravel stuff. And I want to say you've always sort of bit, you've just stayed around like 15th, even though you've gotten way stronger, uh, the competition and the field is just insanity now. It, I mean, the, it's just really not even comprehensible. So it's like, it, to your point, you are riding probably the best you've ever ridden. So are they, are they saying that on social media, just because that's the narrative you like, it's like a, it's like a community narrative of pity. Do you know what I mean? Like, Oh, I did really bad. Or are they actually like, when you sit down and have a non-alcoholic drink with them, are they, are they like, you know what? I actually had a good ride today. Uh, from my experience talking with them, they think that they actually raced poorly. Okay. Um, and, and, you know, I don't know, maybe, uh, I, 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 maybe it's their ego is not letting them admit that, that, that this is the level that they're at comparative to the rest of the competition. I don't know. Um, I like to look objectively. It, it's nice that the racing that I do, unlike crit racing, for example, it's nice that a lot of the racing that I do, you can compare times year to year. Leadville is a perfect example. You can easily compare a Leadville time from a previous year. And it's just it's just easy to be objective about your result. Did you go faster? Did you not go faster? Was your power output higher? Was it not higher? Um, it's harder to do that for other races like Unbound because Unbound, the conditions could be horrendous and that could affect things. Um, so that's the reason I asked but you Le specifically. Leadville... Leadville 
So, so that's the reason I asked you specifically, yeah. Dylan. Was like, um, yeah, you're in. I think you're in a unique position because I'm. A, I, I do crit racing, and it's like, yeah, there are races I've won, and I've averaged, you know, 220 watts or something. I've lost races and averaged 350 watts. So it's like, mm-hmm. it's so much more about pack dynamic. But you're in a position where it's like you can look year over year. Yeah. And coming back to that question, like, what is your answer? Because you can say, look, I've improved year over year, and of course, the, you want right. the result to show for it. But are you okay with like? getting 15th if you're continuing to improve or are you thinking like what is there something else i could be doing other than a better you know uh watt per kg mm-hmm. performance that will help me break into that top 10 top five yeah i mean I, I i think the answer to that question kind of shows in the races that i choose i no longer choose easy races that i could easily win i mean i could go to local races and win those but it's not interesting me it it's not interesting to me to do that anymore. It's not fulfilling to me to go to a Southeast gravel race and easily win the race. And then I, I just, that's at this point in my career that I, I don't, I don't find fulfillment in that. I would, I would rather have the best personal performance that I could possibly have at an unbound or a Leadville and get 15th place as opposed to sweeping the Southeast gravel series. I, I no, I, I was just about to just to echo what you said. I go out to to Intelligentsia or or whatever it is, like nationals, and um, I get destroyed. Like I'm making a video series about me getting destroyed, and they're hard videos to make. But it's like the point is, is like if I just sat there and crushed Alviso every week, um, I'm not getting any better. You know, like I'm not. <laughs> I I could I could do that. Um, and I certainly that's part of my training, but like it's not going to make me any better. Sorry, Tyler, you're going to say something. I was going to say a joke. It's kind of oh, dead shoot. now. I'm sorry. Okay. <laughs> nah, go, come on. <laughs> uh, well, yeah, it's it's all good. So uh, I was just going to talk shit on myself. So um, th- what's interesting, though, is like we are all in the social media business, uh, which is like self promotion is is kind of the key. And and Dylan, I I look at what you say and how you say it and what you do, and I'm so envious of like this style that you have where it's not results based, even though like your career is kind of results based, like you don't let that be the narrative. And it's so Mm -hmm. refreshing to see you post like I did so well, I did these things right, you know, and I'm really happy with my performance. I got 17th for the 20th race in a row. And I'm like, wow, that's, that's crazy. He's able to like be happy with that. And I've really tried to, to look at it that way myself. Um, but I will say like to, to Chris, you know, uh, I just had a situation at 24 hour worlds where it didn't go well. And I felt so much pressure to make a post about why I suck and have to try to explain it. Uh, and, and that's why I think a lot of people where they're self hyping, they're always like, I'm putting in the grind, you know, it's, I'm, I'm the first one up and then the last one asleep and like all this hype reel, you know, and they're putting a lot of money into it. And then all of a sudden it comes time to perform and it's like, all right, well, I guess on, on to the next one, you know, it's like all this hype, no result. And then just watch me train. And so I feel, I feel for the guys that do that and, and then don't ever get the results. So even though they are maybe you know, objectively being the best they've ever been, dude, it's so hard to like swallow. Hey man, I, I I, I know what you, I know what you're saying. And I do totally appreciate where you're coming from, but I I do think like, you know, using Dylan as an example, like again, sorry, but like to say 17th and make that sound like a lame failure is as we all know, not true. Like, and for 99.99999% 99.99999% of the people who watched one of his race recap videos, like that performance is still mind blowingly amazing. So they're not, they're not getting wrapped up in the, um, Oh, what's the difference between top 10 and top 15 is, is kind of an irrelevant thing. They're not, they're not tuning in for that. I would say that, you know, I just, yeah, it, it it can get frustrating to get, I mean, the amount of play, 
races where I placed between 15th and 20th this year, it was almost every single one. It was, it was a bit infuriating towards the end. I will admit that, but um, yeah, I, I don't, I don't know why I don't necessarily know why my perspective is a bit different, especially different than the racers that I seem to be racing with. Um, maybe I, maybe, like I said, maybe I just think about results a little bit more objectively. Uh, I'm obviously a numbers guy. And if I see numbers trending in the right direction, I'm happy with that because I'm happy with improvement. But but also you don't do a whole lot of like hype stuff on, on yourself. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? You're very just like science based. And so I never see these crazy hype reels where you're like, crushing it and you're and then saying calling it and oh i'm gonna get it you know the future's mine all all this like motivational stuff there's a couple of crit racers and dude it's literally like that is their whole thing is who are you me. talking about tyler can you i i got, I, I got no idea i, I don't want to say i don't want to say his name but like i want to uh, look him up uh I'll, I'll text i'll text you but you can look at every <laughs> single everything they post is like you know, I'm going to get this, like, this is my time to shine, you know, all these posts about how good they're going to do, then (laughs) nothing about the race. And then, you know, oh, next week, I'll see you here next week. And it's like, bro, you, you never are doing the thing you say you're going to do. Right. Uh, But, Mm -hmm. and so I feel like for you, Dylan, you've, you've gotten to a good spot where you just don't feel the need to like self hype yourself. Um, and, And so like, it's really refreshing. And I like reading your race recaps as of where, you know, I, I will say this name Payson. It's like, bro, every single one is like a, a, a novel read. And it's always <laughs> to me complaining. And it's like, bro, I, dude, is there ever a time you're happy? Like it's kind of, I just don't want to read it anymore. You know, Jeff, what do the, um, what do the YouTube analytics say about a winning video versus like a, I don't know. I was I was just about to bring I that up. Break video. Yeah, I'm, I'm glad you mentioned that because I remember having the same mentality. Like, man, if I don't show up and win or have a result or whatever or stand on that box, then like, no, people are going to think that I suck and the video is not going to do well. And the truth is, races that I don't do well in, I don't think there's like there's a story in every race. The the video performance of me sucking is just as good <laughs> of me winning because I'm telling the story of the race. So I try not to get really hung up on the result. As long as like, I mean, even if, even if I do make some terrible blunder, why did I make that blunder? How can you not make that blunder? Like, that's the story I tell about my races. I think Dylan has the same approach. So like it, you really pigeonhole yourself. If you're like, if your viewership, if we're talking about content now and not just personal performance, but if your viewership and stuff is depending on a result, you're setting yourself up for failure. Cause first of all, like I'm a master's racer. Like I'm not going to be fast for much longer anyway. But I adopted this even, you know, when I first started the channel, which is like, tell the story of the race. There's a learnings in a win. There's a learnings in a loss. And um, it's not even fun if you just like if I just went out and just won everything, it'd be nice. I'd like that. But it would get kind of dry and boring. Um, So, yeah, again, that's the reason I go out and get my teeth kicked in at national level races. You still have to ride well. I mean, if to make the video good, there's not no one wants to sit there and watch 25 minutes of someone losing three wheels every corner. There's a th- <laughs> absolutely those like there. It's a little bit harder to tell the story sometimes if you're just hanging on at the back of the pack. Like there is a threshold, right? <laughs> people submit footage. I I do commentary on not just my footage, but people submit footage, and I get a lot of people who submit a race where it's like you just need to be faster. Like I don't say that to them because it's like, <laughs> but that's the truth. Like you just have to grind a little bit harder on the training, get yourself up to the next to where you can actually be consequential. Because if you're just sitting in for the first three laps and then you get dropped, there's not a story to tell other than you should maybe get better at training. You, you know what I was thinking after the whole Unbound Mud uh, debacle this year is uh, Unbound is obviously such a big event that if you do Unbound and if you're a, and you're a YouTube creator, you need to make a video about it. It's just going to blow up. You you just need to make a video about Unbound if you're a YouTube creator doing Unbound. And I was I was thinking, man, what would I have done if that mud section, 11 miles into the race, I just get into that and my derailleur snaps clean off and my race is done at mile 11? Would I even bother making a video? 
Of course. I don't know. Yeah, you would. Yeah. I don't know. This is what happened. Yeah, I think you have to document it, right? <laughs> yeah, I, th- I, th- I think so. But I, man, I would feel so lame about that. Um, well, well, that is so that's a big thing with like the impossible route stuff that we've been doing. We've gotten really, really lucky. But some of these films are like $45,000 to put together. And what if rolling out of the parking lot, I took the front in and break my collarbone? You know, or mm-hmm. a bike doesn't show up. When we were in Bolivia, Jeremiah's bike didn't show up till the morning we were supposed to leave for the ride. And then it's like, well, mm-hmm. what, how do, what do we do here? You know, and then Unbound is very expensive. You put in so much time, so much energy. And then, yeah, if something like that happens, you know, I saw a guy next to me who came from Italy and he flatted, double flatted immediately. And then just like he sliced his tires and that was it, dude. Like he flew all the way across, you know, the ocean to ride for like 10 minutes. It's like, ah, geez, that would suck. Yeah. It's coming back to the personal performance stuff. Like, so what, what is, what does an off season look like for you guys? I mean, is there, is it, is it an off season? We don't stop, baby. It's California. (laughs) So it's similar to here because that's it. Like the whole mindset and concept of an off season doesn't really exist here. Like club racing, club crits run twelve months of the year. You're you're really you could be four weeks away from a good solid bike race at any point in the year. Um, and so, I mean, I know I realize you probably have a bit more of a quote unquote season, Dylan. But like, how does it look for you, maybe Jeff? Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I generally do. Uh, take it off because um, well, most of it's just a, like mental fatigue. I'm just kind of over it. It's just been kind of going hard for so many months. Um, but uh, it's not necessarily the weather holding me back. It's not access to like solid motivating group rides that's holding me back. Um, so I'll I'll usually take um, a couple weeks or maybe a month off. Um, not like completely off. Maybe a couple of weeks like completely off. And then I'll kind of just slowly get back into it. Like, don't bring the cycling computer. Don't look at power numbers. Maybe do some cross training, um, uh, mountain bike rides, uh, gravel bike rides, that sort of thing. But um, yeah, come like around this time of year, uh, I start start the grind again. I, I just love it. Like, even if there weren't, weren't races to look forward to, I just love it. So I continue riding. And we have races as early as, as late January um, that are like 100 plus person fields. So um, that's that's what it looks like for me, but, um, it's probably different for, for folks who like have like seasons that get in the way. What are you up to Tyler? Are you training to skydive or something now? Are you? Yeah, dude, I'm going to, I, I had a pro skydiver reach out to me and he was like, Hey dude, uh, I live kind of close to you and I can get you certified. So we're going to, um, I I've been saying this, that I wanted, I want to skydive into somewhere crazy and then like run out and find a bike somewhere and then ride somewhere cool. Like, I just want to do a, a really cool multi-sport adventure. So I, I'm going to get certified in April, go to the wind tunnel and, um, you know, hopefully not die. But, uh, you know, the thing is, I think it's really cool about, you know, all of us here, Dylan and Jeff and myself is that, um, we've kind of been at this for a long time, but we've all found our own little niche. Uh, and so our, our training looks wildly different. You know what I mean? Um, And so for me, I know that I get really burnt out around this point. Um, And I'll say that this year I tried to be an athlete. Uh, I really felt like, what if I spent 100% of my energy? Could I, could I really do something in the ultra scene? And um, man, I put a lot of work into this 24 hour worlds thing and, and for it to not come to fruition kind of like really crushed me uh, because I reached what I believe is my genetic potential. So a lot of people never actually, they they can always say, ah, well, if I just had more time to train, like I could always be better. I wonder what would I, what I could do if I was better. I feel like I reached the best I could possibly ever be. And I still lost. So then it's like, I don't have any excuse. I'm just not good enough. You know, I just don't, I don't have that dog in me. And do you so, have a coach, Tyler? Or do you do your own uh, training? No, nah, I, I had a coach, but it's um, honestly, I felt like, and so when I had a coach, I was probably objectively my the strongest I had ever been. And I had some really good road race results, uh, but I it burnt me out so quick. And I was like winning training. I would, I would get, my training peaks would look perfect, dude. It would, it was- really. 
you know, oh, don't take this the wrong way. I was going to say, I feel like you'd be really hard to coach. <laughs> just be off the <laughs> reservation. Just he's off. Well, seven when, hours. I, when I was in it, I would, I would hit it to the T like right on the watt, everything perfect to the second. Uh, it was fun, but then I wouldn't really perform very well. Anyways. Um, I don't, I don't have a coach now. I just kind of like kind of train myself based on the the principles that my coach had given me. I mean, you kind of know, right. Um, what you should be doing and what you should be working on. Um, but I don't know what the ultra stuff, man, you ride 20 hours, 30 hours, whatever you, you don't want to look at a bike for a while. And so what's hard is you build and build and build. And then that, that cliff that you fall off is so steep. And so then it's, you know, the peaks and valleys of coming back up and trying to get back into it is, has been mentally really difficult for me uh, this year. And also I don't get paid to do well. I, uh, my financial success comes from content. And this year until this month, I put out six videos. Like I can't be, so I'm an athlete that doesn't win anything and also a content creator that doesn't create anything. So what the fuck am I, <laughs> you know? I, and so like, that was, I mean, when Chris came, dude, you know, I really enjoyed my time with you. And then when you got back to Australia, like I kind of ghosted you a bit and I, dude, I just fell into like a depression really. Like, I, I don't know what I'm supposed to be doing. I just felt lost. I didn't have any creativity. Um, I have that effect on people. You ruined me, dude. But like, I, yeah. I just didn't know if this is even what I want to do anymore. And um, it was really strange. I just lost my way. And uh, mm -hmm. I feel like now I, I have a really clear path at what I want to do for the next two years. Uh, which Please is tell me it's YouTube and not uploading TikToks or something. Oh, you I, like I did start. I did start a TikTok. <laughs> I oh, did. No. <laughs> oh, but uh, no, I mean, I I really want to dive more into you know uh, being a storyteller on YouTube, but I don't want to tie that into results necessarily. And man, the the industry has gotten so competitive. You know, when I went and did Bighorn, uh, Dylan Dylan was there, dude. I went in there feeling like I was really strong. I was stoked. And I was like, dude, I probably could get a podium. I got 50 second. <laughs> you know, I was like, dude, what the hell is this? <laughs> I, I felt so strong and I thought I was doing great. And I, I it was just a joke. You know, uh, I did do two laps of the course. So like I still had a story to tell and like I could flex that a little bit. But um, I, I'm just never going to see a podium. Right. And now Ultra it has be at 24 hour worlds. The competition was like a true world-class competition. I mean, these guys are flying. Uh, and I don't know, man. It's just the sport has, uh, I feel like it's almost kind of passed me by. So how do I stay relevant? How do I provide value? So Tyler, do you, I, this comes from a non ultra racer. Uh, I actually have a lot of respect for you because I don't think that I could do ultra racing because unlike you, I get very tired when 10 o'clock rolls around. I did a 24 hour race one time and I got extremely tired when 10 o'clock rolled around. Like not, not my legs. I just wanted to go to bed. <laughs> um, so, but from what I can tell uh, from, for example, your unbound video and, and other ultra content that I've seen is that Ultra racers don't know how to pace themselves, and it's unbelievable to me. It it actually blows my mind how bad at pacing ultra racers are, and it it's even the highest level ultra racers. They are so bad at pacing; it's unbelievable. I just want to give you an example. So, twenty four hours of old Pueblo, uh, Keegan Swenson, unsurprisingly, has the record for the most number of laps at twenty four hours of old Pueblo. He uh, when he did it, he, I think it was, I don't know, it was 2021 or something like that, but he, um, it was his first 24 hour race ever. And if you look at his lap times, they get slower and slower and slower and slower and slower and slower and slower throughout the race. If you were to pace it correctly, meaning that you had an even pacing for the entire race, every lap time was exactly the same 
you would be and and you were trying to beat Keegan, like you were pacing yourself to beat Keegan's record, you would be one hour down on Keegan at hour 12, and then you would catch him by hour 24. That's how badly he paced it. Um, and Keegan is just one example of many ultra racers that pace absolutely terribly. And I think that I think that success in ultra racing, uh you you could be a lot more successful. You in particular and any other ultra racer watching could be a lot more successful if you learned good pacing. Well, uh, I I agree, sort of, but let me defend myself. So uh <laughs> in 24 hour worlds, it you pretty much knew exactly what the winning pace was gonna be, which was uh twenty two point four miles an hour. Right. The winner before the winner last year. Oh, it's almost every year someone does a ride around 22.3 to 22.5. And so mm-hmm. what's difficult is, and, and my thought was, well, I'm just going to average 22.3 uh, the whole mm-hmm. time. So I'm not going to go too fast, you know. But as soon as you go below, like if you paced way below that, by the time 12 hours pass, now you need to like negative split it and go above that. You just do not have that power. It doesn't matter really how you pace. Like you just don't have the energy at hour 20 to all of a sudden now make up a deficit. So you kind of have to like yeah. be close to that. I was going to ask that um, just that exact thing, Tyler, in terms of does the same, because I don't know, I've never done a bike ride more than seven hours. So does the same pacing principle, and Dylan, you might know as well, do the same pacing principles apply for a one hour time trial? same as a four hour road race, does that carry over to 24 hours or does the whole even pacing strategy go out the window? Because when you're 16 hours in, you just, you're going to be cooked anyway. I, I find that I, no matter what I do for the first couple hours at hour 25, I'm doing 180 Watts. It doesn't matter. You know what I mean? I just don't have anything. There's just nothing there. Um, but so I, the two national championships that I won, um, which, the second one I did, one guy showed up. It was me versus one other guy. So like, whatever. But uh, I did pace that very, very well. Um, and, you know, I, I ended up riding 32 hours. Like, I did well. But the 24-hour thing, like, I knew what pace I had to be. And I don't want to get too much into the the aerodynamics, but my setup was so slow. So uh, mm. I, I had a friend from Wisconsin. We both did a, a, a warm-up lap. And he did 22.5 at 180 watts. I did 22.5 at 257 watts. So like, what the fuck? You know, I, I just, whatever, whatever was going on with my setup, my body position was just terrible, right? I mean, I just wasn't arrow enough. Uh, but with the unbound thing, the group was so big that it, it, in my mind, it's like, well, I need to stay with these guys as long as possible to get that arrow draft, right? To be able to save mm-hmm. uh, time and energy. But knowing now, I should have paced it because everyone DNF'd in the mud anyways. You know, um, mm-hmm. and the winner, right? He just let everyone go with the mud, walked his bike the whole time, never tried to ride it, kept his bike clean, and then was also on a mountain bike. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, definitely, but he that's what he said. He's like, "Well, I know that I'm not going to be able to ride this, and so I'm just going to, you know, I'll just walk it and I'll catch everyone later." And uh yeah. that was Logan Logan has one of the coolest heads, for sure. Yeah, very... not, not going to freak out when shit hits the fan. Can I move on to some equipment chat? Cuz I want to uh I want to ask some uh what what are we running next year? So, first the first thing sponsorships let's get that out of the way what's everyone running next year because i want to go beyond that i want to get your actual individual opinions on some other things but what what's everyone running sponsorship wise next year jeff what you want to start us off what's the setup yeah uh no, i'm real lucky um like i said racing for mike spikes again so i have a team bike and then i have stuff that that i do with norcal cycling which is separate from that but um what i'll be racing on um for actual sanction like team events is serv- we're on cervello again um, soloist. And what's cool this year, um, is first of all, I like the soloist. I have it right over here. Um, it's just going to be the new, the next year's model, but what's cool is we're, is we're building it out. Um, so we're, 
we're buying um, the team's buying frames and then buying components separately so we can get it exactly how we want it because we're picky cyclists we like that sort of thing whereas last year it was like do you want the 56 or the 58 that was like the that was like uh, the thing and we swapped out we had zip sponsor stuff so we were able to swap out some stuff but um is the you said the frames um it's the 2024 frame i'm guessing is it is it different or is it just different paint no it's probably just different paint i don't think they made any changes okay. it was new last year so i doubt they've made any changes i should probably know the answer to that question but i don't think so <laughs> Okay. Yeah, solo is again probably a different colorway, and then it's going to be um, uh, SRAM I, uh, Force, I think. Yeah, Force. Um, nice. I'm going to be doing shorter cranks. I've been experimenting with shorter cranks. So I'll be on shorter cranks next year, 165. Um, I watched this one YouTuber talk about how it doesn't affect your performance, so I decided. <laughs> no, I like it because <laughs> news. of the pedal strike Longer thing, right? Like that was. Yeah. I, you, I think you mentioned that in your video, Dylan. But I think the big thing for me is is um, pedal strike because I'm I'm a crit boy. So, uh, so that's big, but, um, 165 cranks, uh, slightly narrower bars. I, um, I don't want to go full like 38. Some people even do like 36. It's crazy. So I'm doing 40. I've always been 42. I'm, I'm kind of broad shouldered. I'm going to do 40 and, um, I angle the, the hoods in just a, just a little bit. I don't go crazy with that either. Um, but I do like that torque that, that you get in the, um, in the drops and we're on envy. I think that's actually finally been confirmed. So it's going to be, um, an envy cockpit so i think they have better uh flare what's the industry term yeah yeah tops yeah, flare tops to drops yeah um so so i'm, I'm kind of stoked about that and then i think it's just going to be the um the uh wheels that come with the the cervello bikes the reserve um i don't i'm not sure which ones i think 40 44s are you gonna is it gonna be two by or one by with the SRAM? ah two by yeah okay none of that okay. one by nonsense <laughs> I've got 36 wide bars on my gravel bike, actually. Is it, so it's, it's 36 measured at the hoods? Yeah, yeah, it is. That is so narrow. I mean, it's, <laughs> it's a preference it's thing, right? It's not that right? narrow, Jeff. You're just, you're just getting old. It's, that's all the kids are on. No one run, even runs. 38s is like, that's two years ago. I, you know, you get, you get used to it. It feels narrow when you first get on it, but you, you get used to is it. Is it more aerodynamic, though? Because I feel like when I go really narrow, my elbows go out anyway uh probably depends person to person um i mean you i i think you should probably consciously think about not flaring your, your elbows <laughs> just pull your elbows in solved <laughs> just quickly jeff so that's that's the team rig but what about that beautiful scott foil um not so beautiful anymore yeah i oh yeah i was on that bike um so yeah well, we I need sound to... effect buttons here chris you could you should have pressed the <laughs> yeah, crying yeah. you guys <laughs> wah, wah, wah. you guys proper podcasters or what you need yeah you need yeah. some sound effects um yeah I, I won't get too much into it because i'm in the middle of this whole legal dispute now but uh in early september it's been a little bit now um i was making the final preparations for um arguably the biggest race of the season for me i really wanted to um to defend although defend from two years ago. I had a kid the year before that. So I didn't, wasn't able to defend, but I wanted to, uh, to win, uh, the state champion or the district championship race again. And, uh, yeah, anyway, final week of preparation and this motorist just pulls out, uh, right in front of me and, um, mm -hmm. and plows into me. So, uh, yeah, I was pretty banged up. Bike is destroyed. Um, so yeah, I won't, <laughs> I won't get too much into it, but sorry, sorry to, sorry. Scott bring it is up. no yeah. longer beautiful. Yeah. You saw it when it was at, you know, at its peak. That's on my list, that bike. That's on my list. What about you, Dylan? What are you what's what's twenty twenty four? Big announcement? Oh man, I don't think that I'm allowed to talk about it. Oh, okay. uh, I wish I could nice. talk about it. If this podcast was being recorded mm. in January, I could talk all about it. But uh there's gonna there's gonna be some there's gonna be some change ups and okay. uh that's all I'll say. Ooh, are we talking okay. to equipment specifically or team as well? uh everything it's all it's all <laughs> switching up <laughs> wow okay. hopefully it's one of those great i love the american team names they're like they're like a sentence long like trek bikes presented by jukebox with kfc united it's like what is that a statement or a team uh, yeah but i would say that a lot of the gravel guys are just doing their own program just like straight up privateer mm -hmm. they're so there there is no team it's just individual so that they can grab you know more money uh um, so i don't know if what's that's what's going to do what's your setup 2024 vc uh yeah i mean 
I was really, really fortunate to sign a two year deal with Canyon. Uh, I honestly, you know, I mean, I didn't think it was going to happen. Um, and so I was, look, I've, I've built my, and me and Jeff just had a huge conversation about this, um, where like, how do we make money and stuff? And I've built my whole thing off of like three brands. Like I have direct relationships with like a handful of brands that essentially do like, you know, a salary. And so a lot of my eggs are in like very, this a one, one basket or a couple baskets. And so if that changes, you know, I go from making a good living to being homeless, you know, I don't really have a whole lot of other rev, you know, revenue sources. Um, so it was really scary, man, for a minute. And like the industry has totally gone backwards. Uh, you know, a lot of people are, are cutting back that the budgets aren't like the way they used to be. We've all got very spoiled, both the brands and the influencers, right? Like what we expect to get paid for our work was is probably not realistic. And then the brands were expecting the kind of views, you know, for what they were paying. It was just, it was wild. So now it's like, changed up a little bit and yeah but what are the bikes tell me about the bikes don't care about the brand <laughs> what's the bike it, i mean well can, everything canyon you know uh so one big change New is that, grizzle uh well i have the pink and blue grizzle that's i'm the i'm the only one in america i can't believe that bike's called a grizzle like i know that's <laughs> so gen z wow it's, it's a sick bike but i so my deal with canyon is would be like I get one bike a year for me personally, but then just unlimited demos. So whatever bike uh, I need to be on for that project uh, will be, yeah, through a Canyon. So the, the the difference is though that we'll probably just stay spec'd. So not to get too much into the weeds, but like I I was, I had a wheel sponsor, a tire sponsor, a drive sponsor, like all this stuff. And Canyon was kind of like, well, we're, we can't use any of your photos because they're not spec stuff you know mm -hmm. so then it was this uh drama a little bit between hey we've got this guy who's doing great content but we can't use him for any of our social assets so what the hell uh so it was you know a lot of work to try to be like how can i be the best value to canyon and that's uh essentially running you know a lot of spec stuff uh mm -hmm. through them so. so what's what's the canyon spec then are they shram or shimano well, so the way they do it is they ask you uh, if you, because they're both, you know, but so what do you prefer? And if you are okay. Shimano, then that's Shimano and DT. And if you're SRAM, then that's SRAM and Zip. Uh, so mm -hmm. I really, really like SRAM. I've been running that Shimano stuff and there's, you know, some upsides to the hood buttons, I guess. I can swipe my computer left and right. But outside of that, dude, I don't understand how anyone can ride Shimano. Like it just makes <laughs> no sense to me. Got that out of the way. Now you can't say the bikes that you are supported by. So take them out of it. But I ask Chris this all the time. If you could ride a bike next year that you legitimately think would be a performance gain for you, what would it be? Jeff, is there a bike that you just go, oh, I'd love to run that? I don't, I don't know. I think that, my hot take on that whole thing, I think that once you get to like that like premier top tier spec, like I don't think it makes that big of a difference. I think it comes down to personal preference. Um, I don't have a fantastic answer. I've heard good things um, about the the Cervelo uh, S5. Um, it's really light. It tests really well. A lot of people locally have had a lot of success in big races with it. Um, does that mean it's going to be faster than whatever, you know, uh, the SL eight or something? Pro probably not. Um, but, uh, but I'd probably give that a shot. I think it looks really nice. Um, yeah, it, it's, it's light, uh, and I've heard good things about it. Any, what about any, any brand that you don't already currently ride? Yeah, I don't know. I really like that Scott until <laughs> I got plowed into. That was nice. <laughs> um, uh, Yeah. I'd, I'd probably, I'd probably try the Cervelo. By the way, like Mike's bikes is, is Cervelo. Like <laughs> I'm choosing, uh, I'm not choosing that because uh, I'm on the soloist. That's, that's through okay. the, that's, that's through the team. But, um, yeah, uh, this, yeah, this guy, this Scott was pretty nice. I, I'd like to try all those top tier ones and like, see if I can tell the difference. Um, but, uh, but the Cervelo S5 is nice. I, I'd, I'd like to give that a shot.
It's quite interesting. There's some people that are, or some riders that are s- just so invested in the bikes that they've, they've, they've got a 20 bike ranking of everything they'd want to run. And then there's other people, it sounds like you and maybe, maybe even me in that case, they're like, ah, I don't even know. I, I, <laughs> I mean, it's more interesting when someone has a 20 part list, but it doesn't necessarily mean it's. Marketing yeah, is really marketing game. is really powerful, and they really want you to believe that you have to spend this. Like the reason you're not finding success is because you don't have this thing. Like that's the story they're telling, and they're really they're really good at it. You know what I mean? Um, but I don't think that's the case. And I talk about this a lot on the channel. I think the most important thing is like how does the bike fit you? You know, you could have a a fifteen thousand dollar super bike. If it doesn't fit you, you're going to do better on the two thousand or one thousand dollar or even five hundred dollar hand me down bike that fits you. So uh, I think that like you really start to get to to these tiny little diminishing returns that only make sense if you have exhausted all other low hanging fruit up to that point once you get beyond like the you know i'd say like like ultegra or force tier is like anything above that like yeah it's you're going to maybe save some grams here and there maybe it tastes tests a little bit better in the wind tunnel but if you're in a crit and you do like the one wrong thing all those gains and then some are gone you know what i mean it's mm-hmm. like one small decision makes the biggest difference how much is yeah, whatever, water is in your water whatever, bottle, whatever. right? Like, nah, that's nah, the nah, biggest nah, thing. Nah, rubbish, 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 rubbish. <laughs> he doesn't now, want to hear it. Now, uh, I'm, I'm glad you asked the question, right. Jesse. I, Chris, I, hit me. On. What's your what dream? What's making you wet yourself? So this, okay. I really, I really want to try. So I really want to try the package, the full Yumbo Visma package. So not necessarily like the bike, or the, the paint scheme or anything, but I want to try the one by SRAM. Yes, whatever, Tyler. Like with the reserve wheels, like I want that set up and I, will it make me faster? I don't know, but I want to know what it's about, right? That's, that's definitely like just nibbles away at my brain quite, quite a bit. The other one is, is kind of the, the Zag, which is like a titanium road bike, like a full vibe bike but set up real premium. So like a, a nice envy bar and stem, maybe integrated bar and stem at the front and really nice lightweight carbon wheels, top end group set on it. But just, but that's my, my vibe bike. And then I've got the package. That's, that's my, that's like why titanium, perfect, why that titanium thing? I've, I've seen those and they're incredibly expensive and like, they're like yeah. Rolls Royce of bikes, but like, why, what is the titanium doing for you? Well, I can't, I do, I love that look of the metal, but I do sort of feel like from a performance perspective, the titanium is going to give me a little bit more than the steel. Um, just ultimately it's just going to be a lighter build. Um, and I, I do, I just love that matte finish, like those mosaic bikes. I love the matte finish on them. I wouldn't want it like set up too much as like a full, like enduro spec looking thing i'd still want it like looking like a road a road race bike but because ultimately that's what i'm going to do but yeah it's it's that kind of setup i think that's bizarre chris that because that's this the yumbo package bike is kind of what you've already been riding for the last two years i'd love to see you rebuild your specialisma rim brake with those fast sports tune hub wheels i'd love to get you back on that your bike from three years ago and compare I, just from your can, writing style. Can I, before we move on to Dylan or, or, or vegan or, or whoever, um, can I just do a back seat really fast? Cause I am like a sucker for equipment too. Don't get me wrong. Like I love it. <laughs> uh, and I do have this bike here. I'm going to be testing cause I want to answer this question. I'm gonna make a video about it is like, it's blurred out. What is it? Um, it's meant to be blurred out. You can't see it. No, I'm just kidding. Oh, no, you, it's a wind you, space. You'll see it on the full screen. Oh, okay. Wait, if I do this, maybe you can... anyway, uh, it's a wind space. <laughs> it's a wind space bike. Cause I want to, I want to answer this question. It's like, if if I were spending um, money on like a brand new setup, what would it be? And it wouldn't be it wouldn't be the S five because that thing's like fifteen thousand dollars. I wouldn't spend that much money on a bike. I wouldn't. Sorry, I just squashed my opportunity for a, a partnership with Cervelo. But uh, <laughs> but I want to see like this is so much cheaper. This package right here, you know, you get the wheels, the bars, and the frame, and then you can build it up however you want. If you have a group set, you can choose one hundred five. You can choose like whatever tier you want of group set. And it still comes in like half cost. Mm-hmm. If it were had Cervelo written on it or Specialized written on it, it's like 50% the cost. And I was very reluctant for a long time. I, this is a, a video I'm, I'm going to make about this. But like, I think that the quality control issues come a long way because that was always my big reservation is like, am I, 
I am terrified <laughs> to go bombing down to descent or like the last corner of a crit on something that was made from one of these like these these Chinese um, brands from you know seven years ago when I last gave it a shot with wheels because they like fell apart and disintegrated. I wasn't the only one having that issue, but I think that's come a long way. So that's what I'm testing. Um, mm -hmm. and that's what I'm going to make the video about is like, is this nice. the bike that I would buy? Can you please do a proper, how does it ride? That's what's always missing. It's like the weight is X. I built it up. Oh bro. That's y. what we do over here. Yeah. That's like all yeah, of them. Like, I'm going to say, you can go like, find the spec somewhere else. Yeah, like that's not what I yeah. do. Yeah. How does it actually ride? And I'm going to put it to the test because that's, mm. yeah, I'm going to, that's where it always comes down. It's like, it's hard. It's a, it's a quarter of the cost of a name brand frame or, or whatever it is like that. And, but what people generally, when they're buying it is they want to have the bike that could have X brand sticker on it, a name brand, and it rides the same and they're getting it for a quarter of the cost. And that's where me, I personally, cause I haven't rid of them. I still don't know if you're able to get that for a quarter of the cost. Cause in a lot of time in the reviews, people have a hard time explaining how they ride. In terms of a ride quality and responsiveness yeah, and things like that. That's been the approach for previous videos we've done along the same vein. Um, and uh, that's not it's not gonna change for this one. Um, can it win Alviso? You know, I'm gonna take it out to Alviso. Uh, you know, I'm gonna go mm -hmm. down some really technical descents um, that I know super, super well, and I'm gonna be really pushing it to its limits. So I'm gonna have that discussion. Awesome. Well, nice. I, so uh, I did I did a video a while ago about a hundred dollar bike versus a thousand dollar bike versus a ten thousand dollar bike. And it it crushed great, you know, lots of views. Uh, and to the point that I did this, this step, you know, like the testing and the hundred dollar Walmart bike was maybe, I think it was two minutes slower than my $10,000 Canyon on a climb, which isn't very, you know, it's trivial, but you did not want to ride that hundred dollar bike. It, it just was the worst experience. And I said in the video, I said, this isn't even a bicycle. Like, I don't feel like I'm riding a bicycle. This, this feels terrible, mm -hmm. you know, but the thousand dollar bike, which was a Schwinn, I do blindfold me and, and change out the bars. I, I would have a very hard time telling you what bike I was. That's on. what I'm saying. You get to a certain point and maybe it's even a thousand dollars. You get to a certain point and it's like the, the differences are so minute. And and uh, maybe you guys disagree with me on that one, but I'm, I'm yeah. But the frothers out there always go, oh, you know, it feels roughly the same. But oh, geez, it's you know, the S5 is just it's just a quick bike. It's just because you, you 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 people say that, but then the chat you get on a bunch ride isn't that from the guys so, who bought the S5. It's so hard right? to figure it out. <laughs> the yeah, guys who are on the I S5 think... are going to talk about how great the S5 is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But it's justify I, the money. Mm, yeah. I, I think it takes, uh, you know, like, like someone who has a good palate, right? They can detect a lot of different things. If you haven't been riding that much, or if you're not in tune with your bike very much, then it's going to be really hard for you to even know if it's good or not. And I would say that, you know, if I have my perfect bike, the one that I just, every part on it is exactly what I want. One, a big part of that is just the way it looks. Like if I lean it up against a wall, and I'm just like, hell yeah, dude, that shit's dope. Like that, that's going to make me feel better about riding it. Uh, and then, you know, it gets into the geometry and some of the small things. But um, what would that bike be, Tyler? What, well, canyon aside, yeah. what would you, what are you picking? What's the, what do you just look at and you just go, oh, you know, one day. <laughs> well, I mean, so it depends on if you're on dirt or road. But so for me, if I could only have one bike, uh, I, I, I feel like the air road is just oh, makes for fuck's it, sake. it can't be it, just, it can't I, be the brand you're sponsored by. Okay, okay. So the the if I couldn't ride a canyon, uh yep. I would the felt um time trial bike that has like a weird like a whale hump in it. Like just visually, I think that bike looks super dope. And so if I was gonna have something non-sponsored, it would be the the felt uh time trial bike with the Princeton carbon works wheels just like these oh, yeah. weird curves everywhere just looking so futuristic and wild and uh I, I want i'm like an early adopter to technology so all the new shit you know an oval ring uh oversized titanium 3d printed pulleys you know weird uh, roundy rims 
Dude, this give, bike give, is give, so give. ugly. You guys have to look this <laughs> oh, up. Oh, no, my wait, God. Wait, wait, wait. It's not ugly. Quick poll. Who thinks, <laughs> who thinks Tyler's bike is cool? So I'm talking about the Aeroad one by with the mountain bike. It's like one to one ratio. You've all probably seen it at some point. Like, so Tyler thinks it's the shit hottest thing known to man, right? With the oval rings. What, what, out of 10, Jesse, what would you rate it aesthetically? Oh, I think it's cool. I think it's like a 10 out of 10. Just because oh, it's wow. like ugly, techy. <laughs> it's cool. It, it's cool. Like, I, I rate it. Jeff, you've seen it, haven't you? You're talking about his uh, his one bike, or you're talking about the futuristic felt? Yeah, the 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 Frankenstein bike. The the white. I, I think I rode. It, I, I was with you last year. I rode it. it was the all white era road uh, with the fifty four front with the oh, eleven fifty two. Right. Yeah, I remember rear. that. Yeah, I'm here for it. It'll look good. Two thumbs up. I I am a sucker for Frankenstein bikes, so I think it's dope. I love it when people try to optimize their bikes for whatever they're doing. It looks a million I times better it. than the the um the ultimate. That thing is that. Oh yeah, that's, that's true. Yeah, I mean, I like the I like the shapes of the arrow. Don't get me wrong. It's just when he puts it up against the wall, and it's like he he. he you always take pictures of it like with the the opposite of how a road picture should be taken. So you end up putting like the chain in the I don't know what that rear 52. cassette is. It's probably you probably got like a fifty back there 52. or something. Yeah, and you always take that picture of it like that. And I'm just like, no, <laughs> this is everything wrong with road biking. No, you should have a 54 at the front and 11 at the back, and we are happy. The only thing that annoys me about the, the air roads is, for, I don't know what they're doing with the geometry, but the stems always look quite short. So mm. I personally like the, long, the look of a long stem. That's probably the only thing. Uh, I like a short stem with the you know, really short hoods, like, like closed in. So like, that's another thing that I really like about my air road is you can have a 38 width bar because it collapses and then you can turn the hoods in. So you're like 34 on the hoods. It just feels so good. I feel better climbing in it than the ultimate. Uh, even though the data is probably definitely not there to, to say it climbs faster. I just, it, I just feel dope when I'm riding it. You know, and so regardless if uh, if it's faster or not, um, I, I feel good. I always make this statement every time I, I finish one of my like equipment videos where I'm like, yeah, it's probably not a good idea to spend so much money on a bike. And then I always finish it. But it's like, yeah, but if it makes you happy and it makes you ride more, it's probably a good decision to spend all this money on a bike. So uh, I'm with you on that sentiment. Sorry, D I think Dylan's up. Yeah, so I so what are the what are the four marginal gains? We got tire rolling resistance, we got drivetrain efficiency, we got aerodynamics, and if you want to throw weight in there, you can throw weight in there. Uh, weight is the easiest to measure; you just need a scale. Drivetrain efficiency is quite hard to measure, but we have sites like Zero Friction Cycling that are working on measuring uh, drivetrain efficiency of various parts. Um. And, you know, specifically lubricant. And then we've got the amazing site, BicycleRollingResistance.com, that is measuring tire rolling resistance. What we don't have is a third-party objective uh, site or person or group of people measuring aerodynamics. And the aerodynamic claims coming from the industry are absolutely wild. And I think people are just numb to it at this point. And if we're talking about bike frames... The main gain that you're going to get from a bike frame is the aerodynamics. And it's hard to say which bike is more or less aerodynamic because you're comparing what Specialized has to say about their own bike versus what Cervelo has to say about their own bike. Um, we need, I, I, it would be amazing if there was a third party objective uh, group of people doing aero testing on bikes. You're such a so, nerd. You're such a nerd, dude. I'm just like, I just wanted to look cool. And you're like, let's <laughs> break down every reason why I would want. But so but <laughs> to, to that point, I think you're, there's another factor, which is your body position. So all of those things could be great. Mm -hmm. But if you can't get arrow or if your CDA of your body position is terrible, um, mm -hmm. th that could negate all of those benefits, right? 
It's one of the things I liked about that new BMC, the the, the fifty thousand dollar road machine R. I liked what they were doing at the front end, essentially forcing you onto no matter the no matter the geometry of the, or the size of the bike that you were getting, they were putting you onto their proprietary handlebar setup, which again is their own aero testing, whatever at this point. But that that seemed to be even putting riders into what from a from someone just even looking at it looked like a relatively aero position. So you didn't name us a you didn't name us a bike. You didn't. Yeah, name I guess us I anything. didn't. I guess, I guess I didn't name a bike. He's gonna spoil it right now. <laughs> so I, I I could talk. You know, I could talk all day about tires, and it's because I have some objective metric to compare tires, and it's it's thanks to BicycleRollingResistance.com. I mean, I test my own tires on gravel, um, but but it's amazing how easy BicycleRollingResistance.com has made it to compare one tire to another when you don't actually have the tires there to test for yourself. Uh, and I guess what I'm getting at is, is I don't, I don't care what bike I'm on. Okay. I just want it to be the fastest bike that it can possibly be for the given course that I'm riding. So what you're kind of saying is like you froth all the accessories around the frame like that's where you're spending your mental energy i froth i froth the frame too i'm just saying it's so hard to know what frame is faster than another frame it's very it's extremely hard to know even that. the tires getting back to what you mentioned about tire and this is like a whole rabbit hole we could we could talk spend a lot of time on but if you just say like okay this tire is faster than that tire in terms of its rolling resistance but what about like in, in a corner, like which one grips better? Cause the slower tire in a test might be the faster tire in a race. Now I'm coming at this as, as a crit racer where like, I would gladly take a tire with like lower pressure, much bigger contact patch that is objectively slower if it's just like a straight line test, but that's not a race. I want the one that's going to get me to the last corner first with the highest rate of speed. And that might be a slower tire as you test it. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, I, I I agree with that. You can't, it, you have to take those rolling resistance tests with a grain of salt um, because it's it's not actually a test in the real world. It's a test on a drum. And also there's other factors. There's puncture resistance, there's traction, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and what's nice they, about they, what Vegan does with the, the 24 hour thing is like a lot of those, like you can get much closer to like, what is the fastest setup? You know, if you have enough money to throw at it, right? Not just because the, fastest equipment's expensive but also body position is incredibly important and like time in a wind tunnel is very expensive and kind of unfortunate that that's a barrier for performance at those types of events yeah the longer you go obviously then the greater uh those gains are you know over over 30 hours you, you know if you're saving one watt i mean that becomes such a huge difference uh, and so that, you know, there's more technology or it's, you can lean on it a little bit more, but the body position. So to, to get back to 24 hour worlds for me is that I didn't put any time into that. I just put time into my fitness and I was like, well, I'm just going to have the best motor ever. Uh, but then I, you know, it didn't really matter because my body position was so terrible, even though it kind of looked like it looked arrow, but I was so comfortable. Like at no point did I feel uncomfortable, which should have been my first clue to be like, oh, I'm just not, I'm not arrow enough. Uh, but yeah, I mean, it, I, I was losing so many Watts. I heard about tools and I like, you don't necessarily need to go in a wind tunnel. Do they have tools now that like, will like just map your frontal area Are there, does anybody know, like, is that a thing that should be a thing? Uh, I've been using a aero sensor off and on. Uh, it's a little, it's a little bit finicky at this point. Um, I think that I could see 10 years down the line, aero sensors getting advanced enough that they are kind of like power meters, whereas serious, serious racers have them and it's pretty standard and you can see your CDA in real time. It's definitely not there right now. They, um, is it its own standalone thing or does it use like an app that uses like the, the, the camera on your phone or something? No, no it goes, you, it goes it, on your bike. Yeah, it goes, it goes on your bike and while you're riding, it measures wind speed. It's like a little snorkel that goes off the front yep. of oh, the I've bike. Seen those. Uh, yeah, I was, I was trying to think of a word to describe. Okay, no, no, I've, like I've seen well. those, snorkel, but how does that good. help if you're, um, 
Like if you change your position, it's measuring, it just measures wind speed. So if you change the one that I have, you, you don't, I, what I told them is that they need to set it up so that it's, you can see it on your Wahoo or your Garmin. Cause right now I have to use a quad lock and look at my phone, but as you change your position, you can see your CDA go up and down in real time. Yeah, so see. it's measuring wind speed. And is it looking at your power or you have to hold a constant power? Yeah. Yeah. You're, it's looking at your power. Uh, you connect your power meter to it. Yeah. Okay. It's got an amp plus. So you have to be really accurate with your, like you have to have really cons not accurate, but yeah. consistent power output for that. So, so this is why I'm saying it's a little bit finicky right now, because there are a lot of variables that mess it up. Braking messes it up. A car passing you messes sure. it up Too too heavy. Crosswind messes it up too much. Climbing messes it up too much. Cornering messes it up. Like it's very finicky at this point. Have you made any gains from using it so far? Any changes that you've implemented from it? No. Not enough, no. not clean enough data. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> well, I want to I want to ex experiment more with it, uh, and I probably will. But at this point, I can't say I have. I, I can't remember the triathlete's name. Uh, he rides for Canyon, and he did a whole video about them using it, and they were doing real world arrow testing with that little snorkel thing, and and they he found that the praying mantis style of arrow bars was way slower mm -hmm. for him. Uh, because he couldn't put out as much watts. So like the, it, it almost like opening up his frontal area was faster for him because he could put out more watts. And so it was really interesting. They kept showing his CDA, you know, they would change something by like two degrees and then he would do it again and again and again. And they, they found a really good position for him that on paper probably shouldn't be fast. Yeah, I, I was lucky to get a couple of opportunities in the specialized wind tunnel and um, to make to make content, um, which was cool because specialized like bring whatever equipment you want in here. And it was more about body position and stuff like that. But um, anyway, my the point I the reason I brought that up is you guys probably know this, but maybe people listening to this don't, which is like it's all about speed, right? Like there will be a position that you could adopt where you could just make all sorts of power. Um, but th that's probably going to be slower because you have this. You know, you're really upright and you're you're blocking the wind. Likewise, you could get in the most like efficient, best CDA number position possible. But if you're not trained for that, and if you're not good at producing power in that position, that's not the fastest either. So it kind of depends on what you're doing. I tested my my sprint position in there and made a video about like optimizing your sprint position. And um, one interesting thing that I that I arrived at at the end of that video was, um, uh, you can adjust it based on what's going on. Um, so like I get in a unsustainable, really arrow position in that final moment of a sprint, or if I'm, uh, you know, bridging across to a breakaway or something like that, because I know I'm not gonna have to hold it for very long. Um, and same could be said, like for the, the ultra endurance stuff that you do, um, Tyler, which is like, if you're going up a, a big climb, like, you know, at what speed it, does it make more sense to adopt a less aerodynamic position and like vice versa. So it's like that, there's a really interesting thing there. It's not like you just set it and forget it. It's it's all yeah. you're always adjusting it based on on what's in front of you in the road. Do you coach yourself, Jeff? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I was um I people will fiddle around on this with like position changes and things like that all the time, and then I quite often I'll ask, like, how often do you train in your your aero position? Oh, you know, probably in there for five minutes once a week. Like people don't really think to train it that much. Um. Same with sprint. Like someone will be doing crits. I'm like, oh, how often do you specifically train your sprint? Never. Oh, I'll do a few sprints in a ride once a fortnight. It's just, it's pretty amazing. Like I made a training related video ages ago talking about specificity is important in training. A lot of people said, oh, it's not that important. You know, you just got to get fit and you'll do it. But at a, at a point, specificity, it's easy to do because training your position doesn't take rocket science. You just got to go out and do it. And, be uncomfortable in there for a little while but people forget to do that sort of stuff well i'm gonna, gonna, I'm gonna add to that for to a second it. i'm gonna add to that for a second so uh there's a guy local to me mark tucker and um he's so a, arrow. very very successful masters rider he has that's all he trains is the arrow position on a road bike he might mm -hmm. be one of the best eddie merck style ttists in the country uh and it's so it's changed the way i look at riding because I would like, we would do a group ride, group race ride. I would be in his draft doing 
400 watts and he'd be doing 300 watts. And I'm like, well, that's not fair. That's not how cycling works. I'm in your draft. I'm supposed to be doing less watts. But he is so efficient at, at you know putting out the power in that position. And to me, to get in behind him, I can't even put out that power. So then I'm like, it was just so crazy. I was like, you've broke the system. I can't. He's ch- he changes the dynamic of, of, a, of a race as well because he attacks where you don't really normally attack because it's relatively you're traveling at a high speed. Therefore, if you get it, it's quite easy to sort of jump across to that wheel. But the challenge to get across to his wheel is made even worse by the fact that once you're there, you've made that effort and now you're in his wheel and you're still pushing all these watts. And you're like, what's going on? I'm going to get ridden off this wheel. I forgot that you raced with him. You, 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 you yeah. and I raced, raced against him. And it's like, it's so frustrating. And it really changed the way that, you know, I, I started to train. And for uh, the 24 hour worlds thing, I trained only in the time trial position, which at first I could only hold for five minutes. Like I was like, oh, I can't do this. And then I just kept bumping it to the point where I could stay flat back, good power for four hours, you know, and it feel good. Uh, but that took a lot of work to get my body to even want to put out energy there. But the problem is you look like such a, especially if you're doing on the road bike, you look like an absolute turd. Like what the fuck are you doing? Just always riding around like this. You just look no like offense, the Mark, biggest try hard. Jeez, it's ugly. <laughs> Jeez, it's ugly. <laughs> but if you want to be quick, you kind of got to get over it because you have to spend yeah. hours a week down there. <laughs> so so this is kind of like the Dan Bigham thing. I, I'm sure you guys know who Dan Bigham is. He he is he had the hour record. Um of course Filippo Ogana uh went and got it with with Dan Bigham's help. So I guess he's got the second fastest hour record now, but um Dan Bigham does not have world tour level watts and he was able to have the fastest hour in the world by being so aerodynamic. And they're at, I think they estimated that his power output for that hour that broke the hour record was 350 or 360 or something. I mean, it's something that I think all of us could do for an hour. Um, oh. and <laughs> <laughs> that'd be a hard it's, hour. It, <laughs> that'd be a hard hour. <laughs> It's just, but uh, like the the point that I'm making is that it's not it's not bonkers watts. You're right. Yeah, go on. It's not bonkers watts, and he he left no stone unturned when it came to marginal gains. Uh, obviously, aerody- he he was his position is insanely aerodynamic. But then there's there's all the rolling resistance stuff. There's all the the you know uh, the drivetrain efficiency, all of that, and and it kind of goes to show what you can do when you're that much of a nerd. But you also still have to ride in the damn position. If whoever's watching this is like, (laughs) don't worry about your drivetrain efficiency. Like, have you ridden more than five hours in your aero position this week? No. Okay. Well, there's a starting point. I do my zone two rides and, um, or even like tempo interval, like really long intervals uh, sessions. I'll just do those in like a, stupid arrow position not because i'm trying to like be the best at training but because i want to make sure i'm like ready for that position when it matters when i'm gonna break in a crit or whatever or go in the pack in a crit like you just want to be arrow all the time it's just free watts quick random change of subject what's the the widest tires you've run around alviso jeff like have you have you toyed around with the tire width this is a this is a video idea that's in, currently in process uh so i'm gonna be uh i'm gonna be talking more about that but uh but no, I mean, I have run 28, and then if you go back, uh, whatever, four or five years, I was 25, and then if you go back four or five years before that, I was 23. So I, I've just been been following kind of the trends with uh, how the technology's been going. But I'm I'm not one so of those. Is early 28 adopters. as wide as you've 28's gone? 28's the widest I've gone. Oh, I've done actually, I've done 30s or is it like 30, 32, whatever those Roubaix are that specialized as. It's like 30, 32, I think. Okay. Um, I th- yeah, I have a random theory. So. Um, I, I've been riding those reserve wheels, which have, well, they have 28s on them, but they blow out way wider than that. Like they, so that the, the internal rim width is crazy wide. I think it's like 25 mil internal rim width, 28s. It's like, it's over 30 mil wide. So I've been sort of temp, been playing with like pressures 
on our um, crit track here, Heffron Park, which is, okay, it's, it's a similar distance to, to an Alviso, but it's like, you know that patch of Alviso where there's those corners that are kind of bumpy on that back side of it? The, the, whole, the whole Heffron is like that. It's just an absolute go track, right? And so I'd been sort of dropping my pressures down to around, I'd got it down to about 51, sort of in that sort of range, right? So I'm about 66 kilos, that sort of in that kind of range. And bizarrely, I'd found myself putting out more power and being borderline more competitive in that race, dropping the lower, lower pressures. And I, I, I my, my, so my, my theory on this was that at the lower pressures, because of the road surface being so really bad, I can't get over how, like, I can't stress how bad it is, that me at a lighter weight, I was therefore able to put out more power and be, and, and suffer less with, the, I suppose, the vibrations of the, of the track and ultimately therefore put out more power. Is do you reckon there's any truth in that, or am I completely making that up? I don't know the up? power thing. I don't know how that relates. Are you saying just because there's so much chatter, people are like unable to like turn and the pedals? I off? would come away from a heifer and I'm like, I, I battered, absolutely battered. Yeah, we have a road and... race that has like notoriously bad pavement, Copperopolis, and um, a lot of people struggle with that. Uh, certainly, the equipment choice is going to be big, right? Like you get to start getting into Dylan territory, where you're doing like gravel races, and like equipment selection is like enormously important. Um, I think it's less so important in crits. Uh, but uh, but yeah, I mean, I think that the biggest I, I've never heard of people losing power, average power. I've heard of people just going slower because their equipment selection sucks, or they flat out because their equipment selection sucks. But um, yeah, I haven't heard of of any issues of like I can't turn the pedals over because the road quality is so bad. But I, I, I mean, I can't see myself going back to anything under 28 at this point. Oh, yeah, like I wouldn't either. Even if it's perfectly smooth pavement, it's 28. Well, yeah. I, I think Dylan can attest to this that the suspension fork uh, is for gravel is in a performance enhancement, uh, especially when it gets really, really choppy or like washboarded. Um, I feel like you can put out more power with that suspension fork because it doesn't pop the front end up and then you're not having to like soft pedal or you know, just keeps the bike really like planted. Um, I'm a huge fan of that suspension fork. You know where I think you're going wrong though is your tires are too narrow. Okay. <laughs> I, I, I went from I went from. I thought you were going to respond to that more. <laughs> no, I well, okay. So I ran a 50 uh, and a 42, 50 in the front and a 42 in the rear for an impossible route, and I really, really liked it. And then when I mm -hmm. started racing. I was like, oh, that 50 is going to be too big. So I dropped down to a 42. Uh, and then for the last unbound, um, I, it, I didn't think it was going to be that technical, not that choppy. So then I ran 38s. Um, so I, I think yeah. probably that's too skinny. But just on the road, there's got to be a limit. I mean, yeah, I, the, I kind of, so I haven't making. changed. It's kind of fun because I, I just get to sit back and watch. And once you guys figure out the optimal width, I'll, I'll buy a new bike and I'll just run whatever the golden is but you can't run 32s it's so fucking wide yeah That's gotta it, be it slow. depends on the internal width of the of the rim uh like yeah. chris mentioned earlier but uh but yeah part of the motivation for me making this video on like how big is too big for for uh road, road cyclists um you know i'm I'm putting as, as wide as i can get into that cervello which i think is 34 uh but oh. but <laughs> following the the video i made about tire pressure i came into that tire pressure video I'll just spoil it for you guys. L like lower pressure was faster and more comfortable um, or not slower and more comfortable. It was uh, surprising results. Uh, so I came into that thinking like, well, oh, I kind of know already, right? Kind of like arrogant coming into the test. I've been riding a long time. I know that it's going to be like, you know, 65 to 70 PSI is going to be the best. The course we went on is, is pretty bumpy. There's some, some pretty bad sections. There's some pretty good sections. But overall, um, I, thought, I thought 65 to 70 is going to be best. Or like, you know, 65 front, 70 back. Or is that with a 28? That was with the what? 28, yeah. Okay, so that's not that wide. What I'm thinking is, hey, Dylan, I don't know if you'd know anything about like the aerodynamics, but if you're running a, a 32 front tire, that is quite wide. Like at what stage are you losing aero drag because the front tire is so wide? I, I, I can give you numbers if you want. The rule yeah, of 105 is the some. simple answer, right? Isn't that a thing? Depends on your rim width. Well, I, I was I was just going to talk straight about width. So you, we could get into the rule twenty uh, rule of one hundred and five, but 
if we're talking just about the width of the tire, how much of, is that frontal area affecting the drag? At least what we measured when I went into the wind tunnel, on this is on a gravel bike. This is not on a road bike. Okay. Uh, an extra 10 millimeters was five watts at 35 kilometers per hour. Wow, that's a lot. But 10 millimeters is a lot okay. too. <laughs> 10 millimeters is a lot too. So, so what I what I conclude, at least for gravel racing, and I think you could say this for road as well, is that wider tires actually have a lower rolling resistance on rough terrain. Um, and I'm talking about going as wide as like a 2.2 mountain bike tire. The rolling resistance is actually lower than gravel tires. And we can get into why that is. I think a lot of it has to do with uh, mountain bike tires can get away with a thinner casing and not flat uh, over a lot of gravel tires. But I think even with the same casing, if we're talking about rough terrain, a wider tire has a lower rolling resistance, but it has, re it, it's the aerodynamics is not as good, obviously, because the frontal area is, is, but what about, uh, bigger. but what about weight too? That's one thing we haven't talked about. Like that too. Yeah. That's, that's kind of big actually. So I'm making a whole video where I'm going to try to like cram all of that into a you know, bite size 12 minutes or whatever, but I think weight is going to be big too. But again, like I was saying earlier, I came into the tire pressure video thinking I knew the answer. And now I'm like, Oh, now I don't know what to expect <laughs> because I was thrown for a loop on the tire pressure video. Mm -hmm. Maybe the 34s are going to outperform the 28s. <laughs> I, I have no idea and guaranteed. Well, maybe I should, I should be careful with my language here, but like I would, I would very much suspect that the wider you go, the better time you're going to have in a corner at speed. I have yeah. an interesting way we're going to test there's... that too. Uh, I'm excited about that video. So I threw 25s on for the first. I have the DT Swiss wheels, which have 20 mil internals, and I put 25s on those, rode them for the first time probably about four months last night at the chop, right? And my expectation was that, okay, rolling resistance, I'd suffer a bit, but I'd have some, I, the bike would feel snappier again. Like, it, so, you know, sometimes you put the wider tires on with the lower tire pressure, especially for me, like I don't have a punch. So it's like exaggerated and I've got to be honest, like it didn't, it certainly didn't make closing gaps any easier. And I, I got home from that ride and I was like, yeah, test done. Don't need to go back to 25 right. again Feel it and, in your bones. and we'll yeah. put the reserves back on. Oh, I just wondering where it's going to get to. Cause even in the tour, uh, this year, uh, it was a 28 measuring 30 or even some thirties. And so like, well, are we, are we gonna? Is everyone gonna be on thirty fours in twenty thirty? I... <laughs> you guys want to hear a hot take right now? Sure. Uh, Perry Roubaix, they are on the wrong bike. Every rider in Perry Roubaix is on the wrong bike for performing as well as they can in that race. It's is it a sponsor thing? You. It it may be a sponsor thing. Very well, maybe a sponsor thing, but they're not on the bike that's the fastest for Perry Roubaix. Got to be a sponsor um, thing. I can't I... imagine the peak of the sport. They're just like have a big oversight that could that could get them a better result i i think you'd be shocked <laughs> <laughs> um so i i don't know if any of you have watched this gcn video where they test a, a they test a gravel bike a road bike and a mountain bike on the perry roubaix cobbles and the mountain bike was the fastest on the cobbles and now i know what you're all thinking right now well Perry Roubaix is only 20% cobbles or 30% cobbles. It's mostly pavement. The this is this is the same dilemma that we come come to in gravel racing because a lot of gravel races, it's the same thing. It's a lot of pavement and you know, there's gravel sections. Like a BWR is a lot like that. I what I find and when I what I see when I watch Perry Roubaix is that the race is won and lost on the cobbles or the gravel sections, and then the road sections, the race is almost neutralized. Okay, but because everyone's on the same bike. So imagine if Vanderpool shows up on a mountain bike, everyone is going to just drill it on those flats to put him in the hurt, right? So I don't think that he should be on a mountain bike. What I th what I think the optimal Perry Roubaix bike is is uh would be something like an aero gravel bike where it's essentially just a road bike with wider tire clearance and then probably running between 40s and 45 tires, which is oh. mind blowing, which is <laughs> mind blowing to roadies, right? Roadies are freaking mm -hmm. out right now that I just said that. <laughs> but the the Roubaix cobbles are are already so much worse than any gravel that you're not any gravel, you're, but most of the 
does the high speed that they're going at, the pros going at, does that make the cobbles? Because I've heard some weird stuff. I've never ridden anything like that. Does it make them more difficult or less difficult? I've heard some stuff that was completely unsubstantiated with like, oh, they're just skimming across the top so it doesn't feel as rough. Oh, that's a good bunch chat, that one. Well, that it, just, it's, it's they, it sounds like rain across, across the top. <laughs> but Dylan would know if anybody what knows. It is true. The faster you go, the, the less the vibrations. As, as a, as a Paris Roubaix Fondo rider right here, having actually done it on 23 mil Conti gator skins, um, it, it, was, it was that. As soon as you started to lose power and you got slower, suddenly you started falling into the massive gaps between the cobbles or the like stones, they're not cobbles. Um, but yeah, obviously take that with a grain of salt at the speed. The video uh, of when they came into one of the cobble sections and it was crazy because on TV, you don't really see the speed, but there, it was just like a stationary and they're coming in at like 35 miles an hour. And I remember this one guy, it, it, he got like 20 feet in and his front wheel had completely disintegrated, right? He like punctured right away. And then it was just a tacoed wheel. Like his forks were on the ground. It was crazy. So I'm, I'm glad that you brought up that too, because I, I don't think not only would this bike that I'm proposing for Perry roubaix not only would it be faster, I think that it would also eliminate this massive lottery that Perry roubaix is because it's, it's just all about, okay, do I, do I get through the race without flatting? Do I get through the race without mechanicals? And I, I think that that's, that's actually also going to happen with gravel right now. A lot of gravel races. Uh, depends on how rough the gravel race is. But for example, the last race of the season, Big Sugar is kind of like that. It's kind of a lottery to see who flats and who doesn't flat. And I think that will change as as people get wise to to the this tire width that I'm talking about. It needs to get wider. Can you settle the bro science Sir? though, just before I forget on like, how does speed impact, if at all, the um, experience on on cobbles? That's a great question. I can't say that I have an answer to that. I think Myth Mythbusters did a if anybody knows of that show. I think Mythbusters did an episode about uh riding a car on bumpy terrain and whether going faster actually made it smoother or not and I can't remember what they <laughs> can't remember <laughs> so the So look up the of episode that. of Mythbusters and we'll get the answer. <laughs> so yeah, the the average speed's a, average speed of Vanderpool at this year's Roubaix was 46.84 k's. <laughs> So what's a kilometer? I hear what you're saying, Dylan, but <laughs> putting 40 mil tires on it's like 29 miles a an bike hour. that has to ride essentially 47 k's an hour to win a race. Right. Mm. So if he's on, so if he if he puts on 40 mil tires and he was on 30 mil tires, let's say he's giving up. Yeah, how many mils is that? Uh, we know from your your wind tunnel test, right? Right. So let's say he's giving up five to ten watts of aero drag. I wouldn't be surprised if going up to that tire width on cobbles is is twenty watts faster in rolling resistance. It's a good. It's a good point. And that and, and that course is pancake that flat that pretty much, so you can just eliminate the weight penalty of the of the bigger tires more or less. Right. And you could argue if he's if he is therefore saving more energy on right. the cobbles due to the the lower the wider tires, he's therefore fitter to perform outside those. Do do any of you watch uh, Peak Torque? Yeah, occasionally. The, yeah, we've the had him YouTube on. channel Peak Torque. He had a yep. he his he made a whole video because uh, I think he's in agreement that they're on the wrong bike. But he had a he had a different approach. His his. His bike setup that he proposed for Roubaix was essentially a full suspension road bike uh, <laughs> with normal Roubaix tires. So he's he's he, the way that he's going about it is he's keeping the tires the same, but the the suspension on the bike will be soaking up the cobbles as opposed to the tires, which I I think could be another way to do it. Hey, so I know Jeff needs to dip, uh, but I, I'd like to end this with you know what is. What does the future look like for everyone in this industry? We're all kind of have our own little niche. And um, I'd love to know, you know, what is 24 look like for Jeff and, and Dylan and, and Chris and, and Jesse? Like, where, what is your plans to keep rolling in this industry? I'll start. <laughs> uh, yeah, for content. Um, I mean, I absolutely love uh, the, the race stuff. That's never going away. Um, I'm getting more and more interesting stuff coming in. 
um, that people submit. So it's not just the races I'll be doing. It's the races that, um, people, that people send in, um, had some help with, uh, with that will Harden on project echelon. Now he's on uh, Miami Knights, So proper pro, he has really good perspectives. Um, and, uh, Beyond that, I, I love these, I mean, you know, we were talking earlier about the tire pressure test. I love doing these, these real world tests because, uh, you know, like Dylan said earlier, you can't, you can't trust the, the, the arrow testing that, that the uh, marketing departments are trying to cram down your throat. So I like going out there and actually seeing like, what's what, and then talking about the stuff that people don't often think about, um, in terms of performance and where your, your money is best, uh, best spent. I have a lot of content coming around around on this bike right here, this wind space. I want to answer this question of like, if it were my money and I had no bikes or anything, this garage was empty. Like what would I get? You know, what would be the equipment I would start out with? Um, so there's a lot of interesting content coming up like that for me. And, uh, and, um, yeah, I got a lot of, uh, got a lot of support now to, to help. Are you full time Jeff on videos? I can't remember if you still do the, no, and that's, that's the reason I have to, I have a lot of help. So it's, it's made okay. possible with other creators. Um, who um who are definitely involved a lot a lot of times behind the scenes. But no, I I have um yeah, I have a 9 to 5 full-time job. Oh, fuck, that's, that's a, a lot of work. That's impressive. <laughs> yeah. Tell them who are you allowed to say who you work for, Jeff? I I thought this was cool. Um <laughs> Exxon Mobil or something, is it? No, it's not. Oh. You, I mean, you can oh, look okay. at my LinkedIn and figure it out. So I guess it's public. Yeah, I um I'm I work for the federal government. I work for NASA. Yeah, he said that's pretty cool dude when you <laughs> when we were riding and you told me that like i got such a man crush on you i was like Bro, <laughs> yeah, me too. So sick. <laughs> you still have a man crush on me tyler yeah. i know it <laughs> uh do you want to go next dylan yeah so i made it back into the grand prix again i don't know if that's a good thing or a bad thing it's you know an- another year of torture uh, <laughs> another year of getting my ass kicked we'll see um and I will, w- once race season kicks off, I will be making content around those races, kind of like I did this past year. Uh, in the off season, I would like to get back to the science-based content that I kind of built my channel on. Um, a lot of people have been asking for a video on the Frankenstein drop bar mountain bike that I was racing a lot this season. So I'm currently working on that video. That'll probably be my next video. But um, I... I plan to kind of get into this this rhythm where I'm doing science based content in the off season and then more race report video in season. So same, kind very similar to what you've been doing. Like you're not going to pivot or look at no. doing anything extra. No, it's more of the same. Not much pivoting. Well, uh, yeah. Well, just quickly from this perspective, I mean, obviously we want to keep growing um, the show and and be more active. You know. I, Without a doubt, I definitely feel like we've we've found a niche, as we call it in Australia, not a niche. Um, and yeah, I want to I want to keep growing that. But the the next look, and this is a hot, another chat we can hopefully have next time you guys come on. But like, we're really really struggling with bringing on any kind of brand partnership. It's been a I've texted you a lot about this this title. Like, it's just been like beating my head up against the wall with a lot of this stuff. Maybe it's regional based. I'm not sure. But it's it's something that I need to get better at to make sure that this is definitely a sustainable um, piece of content. And I feel that we're getting better at what we're actually producing. And you know, every every week it kind of varies. Some weeks are good, some weeks are bad. But um, you know, that that next step to becoming sustainable is, is going to be the next biggest challenge for me. Also in terms of other plans, like I really want to go, I really want to go to one of these bike shows, like a, a Taipei or a Shanghai or one of those. And just, I just want to see the industry. 100%. Like in its, oh, we're going next year. Like, we're going to go to oh, one. I just, I just want to see that. Like, yeah, get in there and chat to them. So that's, that's one, one thing I'd love to do. Well, that's why I don't understand why you don't have so many brands throwing money at you. You know, there's uh, y- y- both you guys are handsome, right? Uh, you guys, your your show, your show is really well produced. You have like consistency. Uh, I mean, you're checking all the boxes. So I, the only thing I can think of is just the the Australia deal. You know, how do people sell in Australia? 
Um, and I think that that might shut brands down to be like, well, it's, it's, it's just hard. You know, you, you have to have importers or distributors. Like the brand doesn't immediately see uh, a clean path to sales. Yeah. We'll, we'll, we'll get there. What about you, Mike? Uh, it, yeah. I mean, I, I don't want to worry about results. Uh, I'd like to do new projects and I've been running a little bit. I've got some running projects that I want to do some mountaineering. Like I said, I want to skydive. Uh, I, I want to go and tell some just really cool stories that are a little bit more easily digestible and, and, and stretch my legs outside of the cycling community a bit. Uh, I think that my gift is not, um, being a bike racer. I, I have a good ability to tell a story. And so if I could just find good stories, then I could reach a bigger audience that isn't necessarily tied to bikes. Uh, and then also just like, how cool is it to do new shit? Oh, what well, surviving day by day. <laughs> yeah. I'm a dad now, so uh I'm I race gravel know. in the US. <laughs> no way. No way. Well, making a I'm out of everyone here, well probably between you and me Chris, making a content is the I'm probably the least time invested in that. So it's kind of weird to even be um yeah, explaining I have more professional goals because I still have a full-time full-time job with coaching. So I'm more focused on, um, on continuing to progress that. And if the show keeps going along, it's fun and, uh, keep, yeah, keep that moving. But, but doesn't content directly that. relate to you getting new clients? Not really. Um, it does, but it's not, I don't openly promote the coaching through that, uh, that much because that's not in terms of goals with coaching, I don't need that many more riders, so I'm I'm kind of happy with where I'm at. I just have more goals in terms of, um, for example, I have a, I've never coached a rider who's gone to the world tour. Um, now most people that you coach aren't getting coached because they want to go to world tour. Most guys are just masters guys or just recreational enthusiasts, that type of thing. But as a as a coach, you always have, you want to be ticking boxes and goals along the way. And I have there's a couple of riders. For next season, who is their goal to to go well to? And I think it's probably, I'm hoping next year I tick that box off, which is a coach, as a private coach, to to, to be directly coaching a rider who goes well to her uh, is a is a big step. So that's um, you know things like that that I want to tick off. That isn't just you know getting more business is not really what I'm. Um, so what I mean. So your in terms primary of that. your primary source of income is coaching. That's my only source of income, pretty much. Um, that's my yeah. That's my yeah. That's my job. But you, but you're. What about you, Dylan? You, do you not do you not classify because your your um well you, your income would be from from brands, right? Based on the content you produce. Yeah. So I would say there it's three sources. It's coaching, and it, at this point, it's not personal coaching. It's the coaching company that I have and. Uh, with my business partner, it's it's um, from brands sponsoring me, and they sponsor me both for my YouTube channel and for my racing. So, I guess you could say that's both content and racing. Um, so, and am I missing one? It's coaching, it's racing, it's YouTube, it's three. And the waters are muddied. Like the the reality is that work comes in because of an online social media content profile. So, you know, it's, it's not quite as, as simple as like, yes or no, but yeah, I know what you know. Well, Jen, so I'm pretty aware that, uh, Jeff's actually got a, I don't know, he's probably sends rocket ships to the moon or something. That's exactly yeah, um, that's what I'm doing next. So we should probably keep moving. Um, yeah, let's, let's do this, uh, obviously again, real soon. Um, Merry Christmas, happy new year, all, all that sort of, all that sort of stuff. Um, and, and guys. Stay in touch. Thank you so much for your time. Thanks for coming on, guys. Thank, yeah. Thanks for hosting. Yeah, I really appreciate it. Great chatting with yeah, you Yeah, this was fun. This was fun. Appreciate you guys. Legend. We'll do it soon. Chat, guys. Later.